Hi, this is Dennis Surgent. Welcome to Design Team Forming, the process of choosing design team members and forming the team at its initial stage. By now you should be familiar with the design team model and the role of design teams, action teams included, as well as the guiding core council. There are five distinct roles in design team structures, and everybody on a design team is capable of leadership. Everybody who's part of the team wants to make a difference in their work for the benefit of their customers, and these five roles should eventually rotate from member to member. It's critical to recall that design team members should be subject matter experts in the process to improve. They shouldn't be managers of the process or staff people. They should be people who work directly in the process or as close as possible to a customer process. They should be people who are change agents, frustrated by the status quo, people who understand the customer's experience, cooperators, not competitors, more about we than me. Listeners and learners are especially needed. Innovators and early adopters can be prime members of a team, and people all need to be trained in the science of improvement. They need to be volunteers, and they need to be relieved of some normal job duties in order to devote time to working as members of a design team. And foremost, they need to be people who are trustworthy and who trust others. We mentioned earlier why team size is so important. We have to have a minimum of five people to fill these five critical roles. It just so happens that five members are also the optimum team size. Extra volunteers can become coaches to the team members who fill these five roles and they can back up the five critical members. But team performance suffers if there are more than seven regular members. The negative impact is felt first in the logistics of meeting coordination, as well as the actions of the design team. And the greater impact comes with the impact on communication and trust. It's important to recall that five is optimum. You can't have less. And if you get too many more, you're going to start holding down the productivity of the team. So when we start up the design team, we use the model. We start with the aim in the charter. We set goals as a team. We do this with the guiding council. We identify the work roles, who will do what on the team. And again, it's not just these five roles, but the rest of the work that needs to be done. We identify the communications and personal interactions next. And finally, we focus on the defined team processes when we have a better handle on some of these other fundamentals. We use the get a grip model to work systematically through each stage of team development to blend the people on the team with team norms that are unique to that team and agreement by the team members for the initiative the program, the project, problem, or the task at hand. It's also important at a certain stage to make sure that the sponsoring guiding council agrees with the recommendations of that team. We remind everybody that team development phases have been well documented as going through a very normal cycle of becoming more effective over time as the teams move through the forming, storming, norming, and performing phases. There are lots of experiences to share with respect to teams that form and try to move forward with norming by typical methodologies that are used in standard teams or old fashioned teams and committees and task forces. And quite honestly, they are not useful structures for continual improvement. Design teams are like these other teams in the sense that they do have to go through forming, storming, norming, and performing phases. This theory lays out that they're very predictable and that it's really necessary for teams to begin early to get into the storming phase 
and that typically the harder the storming phase is, that it has a greater degree of success for the team. Ultimately, they learn to plan their work and deliver better results through that storming phase. What matters to design teams are things like continual improvement and quality and innovation that are self-funded. We've already taken the money to have a fully functioning, effective process. And so we do that with quality. Our work, though, is about the value we provide to our customers. They pay us to do this work. And so when we find problems with the performance, it's important for us to recognize that this waste, these roadblocks, are not what the customer's paying for. So it's important for us to recognize that we are already funded to provide quality to the customer. This is where we have the opportunity to say no to anyone who asks us to shortchange the customer, the owner, the team member, or the supplier who's part of the stakeholders that are part of our value chain. It's also important for us to remember that we don't take a no from somebody that isn't empowered to say yes. We have several other installments in this topic. I appreciate your interest. Please feel free to call me or write me. We'd love to hear from you if you have questions and need further help with design teams. Thank you.